All right, let's get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to lecture 13. Today we are continuing to talk about the Bernoulli equation, fluids in motion. So last time we derived the Bernoulli equation, talked about the concept of a streamline, which is a line in a flow field where the velocity is everywhere tangent to that line. So the velocity is always along the line. There are never any off-line velocity components. Uh, we derive the Bernoulli equation. It relates several things to each other and says that they are constant. These quantities are constant as long as you're traveling along a streamline in an incompressible, inviscid um, flow, which is steady, right? So today we'll talk about some sort of physical interpretations of the equation in terms of energy and pressure. We'll talk about the different terms of the Bernoulli equation as static, stagnation, dynamic, and total pressure. Um, and then we'll look at applying the Bernoulli equation to different really common situations like free jets um, and uh, flows out of an open tank, uh, confined flows, and flow rate measurement. First, I want to talk about the midterm. So uh, you guys did really well. The average was this is after now, um, after Hyungan assigned partial credit according to what you had uploaded. And I believe everyone's uh, good with that. I didn't hear back from her back from one person yesterday after my email. And I think Hyungan is taking care of it. So mean was 92, which is very good, quite high. Um, high score 100, low score 60. And the standard deviation was 10.33, which is almost perfect. Um, you can see the grade distribution here. So not too many people got down in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And the number of people who scored in the 90s up to 100 uh, really was the majority of the class. So congratulations, you did great. Um, I wanted to uh, bring you back to one of the equations and one of the questions on the exam. I think this was question seven or eight, I'm not sure, but it was about this water strider bug. And I thought it would just be fun for those of you who hadn't heard of this kind of bug. Um, there, they exist. And I actually was at the duck pond just a couple weeks ago and I took some footage. So if you look really carefully, you can see a couple of these water striders just sitting on the surface of the water and they kind of sit there, they float, and then every once in a while they take off and they scoot really fast around. And the thing that's interesting about them is that they're denser than water. So, you know, in principle, they should sink. Um, but if you look at what they actually look like, um, they're in the family Garidae. If you look at what they actually look like, they've got these really long legs, long parts of their legs in contact with the surface of the water. And so what they're doing is they're creating a really strong surface tension force pointing straight upwards that's counteracting the effects of gravity. Um, so that's how they do it. Remember, surface tension force is proportional to length of the interface. So the surface tension that they develop on their legs is equal to the total length of their legs that's in contact with the water. So here it looks like they've got four main really long legs and it's the set, their jointed legs and it's that second segment that's really just sitting there on the water. So it's the length, the total length of these four leg tips that provides the surface tension, right? Sigma times that total length. So, all right, let's change over to um, the slides now. I'm gonna go over to the annotator as soon as I give her permission to share. Here we go. Okay, so, Talking about alternate forms of the Bernoulli equation, well, last time we did not derive the Bernoulli equation, right? And it looks like this. Um, let me just share the annotator over here and we'll get going. Great, full screen it. Okay, 
So last time we derived the Bernoulli equation and it looks like this. It says that the static pressure plus one half rho V squared. So some term it's called the dynamic pressure as we'll see in a minute that looks related to kinetic energy, right? Plus gamma z, so this looks a lot like hydrostatic pressure, right, that we saw in um, statics in the first part of the class. The sum of these three terms is constant along a streamline. And that's equation 3.7, that's the Bernoulli equation. And just in case you weren't here last time, let's talk briefly about the concept of a streamline. So if you have some kind of flow, um, you have to be able, let's say you have a flow from a tank and it's got a little spout and then you've got water coming out and the tank is filled with water. If you want to apply the Bernoulli equation between two points, one and two, uh, and let's say this is submerged, right? Let's say point one is here. You can apply the Bernoulli equation between these points one and two here because you can imagine an uninterrupted, uninterrupted streamline that could travel between points one and two. However, you could not say that a streamline went between points one and three here because that would pass through a wall, right? You're never gonna see a fluid particle traveling that path, right? So for something to, to you can reasonably say, yeah, this, these two points could be connected by a streamline, you have to be able to imagine that a fluid particle can travel from point one to point two. All right, so along a streamline, steady, inviscid, incompressible flow, you can use this equation and it's very handy. All right, so what happens now if we take this equation and we divide each term by the density? Well, in the Bernoulli equation's regular standard form, each term, if you look at the terms, has units of pressure, right? You can tell that from looking at this um, first term because it is just the pressure, right? So pressure has units in, in the SI system of newtons per meter squared or force per area. Well, since this is an equation and we're adding terms, all the other terms also have to have units of newtons per meter squared, right? We know that. So all the terms in the Bernoulli equation have units of pressure. If we go ahead and divide through each term by rho, we get P over rho plus V squared over two plus now GZ instead of gamma Z equals constant along a streamline. And this is really interesting because now you can see that the energy nature of this unit of this equation starts to really become apparent. So if we think about, if we remember the work energy principle from thermodynamics, it says the work done on a fluid particle by all the forces acting on it is equal to the change of kinetic energy of the particle. Okay. Um, so here we have the kinetic energy per unit mass. Um, here, this term is related to the work done by the pressure force. Um, and this term, this hydrostatic term is related to the work done by the weight. Um, and each term have units of energy per unit mass. Um, so just keep this in mind. If you divide the Bernoulli equation by rho, you get the kinetic energy per unit mass plus some other terms that all have um, units of energy per unit mass. And we'll look at an example and come back to this. So uh, if we take the Bernoulli equation again and divide each term now by the specific weight, we end up with P over 
gamma plus v squared over 2g plus now just z equals a different constant, right? The constant from the Bernoulli equation divided by gamma. So now we see our Bernoulli equation, but now it's in terms of different types of pressure heads, right? So if you think back to hydrostatic pressure, if you think of, you know, uh, blood pressure measurement with a cuff and a vertical column of mercury, right? The height of that column of mercury tells you the pressure, right? That's the pressure head. Uh, and you can actually convert between what the pressure is and what the height of the column of mercury is, right? So this first term is that pressure head. Uh, it's, and these terms all have units of length now. energy per unit weight or length. Um, this second term is the so-called velocity head. Now this is really fascinating. This is, if you have an inviscid flow, like we're assuming, it represents the vertical distance over which the fluid would have to fall starting from at rest to reach the terminal velocity V. <laughs> so as you can see, that's very related to the kinetic energy. And finally, we have the elevation head. And that's related to the potential energy of a fluid particle, right? How much potential energy it can store at different heights, which can then be converted into kinetic energy. Um, then this constant on the right hand side is called the total head or the total pressure head. All right, so keep those in mind and we'll look at an example. So here we've got a nice biomedical example. We've got a syringe, it's being held with the needle vertically pointing up, and let's say that it's filled with water, you take the plunger and you depress the plunger and then the water inside the syringe gets shot up directly vertically upwards in a vertical jet. Um, when you apply the plunger, notice these three points in the fluid. There's point one, which is inside the barrel of the syringe right at the plunger. So by compressing the volume, you're gonna get a higher pressure in there. So the pressure at one is gonna be higher than atmospheric pressure. That's gonna, what is going to make the water exit the syringe. Um, this point two is just at the exit. So we know we actually are at atmospheric pressure there. And then this point three is at the very top of the jet at the point where the water particles start to turn around and fall back down because now the force acting on them due to gravity has been balanced by the, for the upward force that they experienced from being shot out of the syringe. So if we think about the different kinds of energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, so-called pressure energy, we can see how it varies along points one, two, and three. So let's just make sort of a little table Um, and look at the different types of energy. So here, second column, we've got sort of kinetic energy, V squared over two term, and then third column, potential energy, which is our GZ term. And then final column, we've got pressure. It's not an energy, <laughs> but it's the term of the Bernoulli equation, so we'll write it down. All right, so let's look at point one here. So what's our kinetic energy for point one? It's quite small, right? Because the fluid is just starting to be accelerated. It's maybe moving with the velocity of the plunger, but the velocity there compared to the velocity of the jet is quite small. So we'll just say that the kinetic energy at point one is small. Um, 
what about the potential energy? Well, if we look at the different heights of points one, two, and three, and we set the height at point one equal to zero, the potential energy there is zero. What about the pressure? Well, as we talked about before, the pressure in the barrel of the syringe is where you're gonna have the largest pressure, right? You get this really high pressure developed from decreasing the volume from pushing on the barrel, and that's what causes the jet um, to come out. So we'll say large, <laughs> not very precise here. All right, move up to point two. This is just at the exit of the syringe. This is this so-called free jet. We'll talk in a little bit about what a free jet means. This is the free jet that's exiting the syringe. Uh, the kinetic energy here is really large, right? Um, it's probably maximum because it's coming out with a really large velocity, and then that velocity is decreasing as you get to the tip of the jet until it comes to zero at point three, right? Potential energy, small, right? It's just a little bit elevated above point one, but not nearly as elevated as point three. Uh, pressure energy, zero, because we're now at atmospheric pressure. Right, so there's no pressure developed over atmospheric pressure at point two because we're in the atmosphere. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. All right, what about point three at the very tip of that jet where it starts to fall back down to Earth? Well, the kinetic energy there is zero because the velocity there is zero. The potential energy there is large, it's the highest out of all the three positions, because that's the highest height, the highest elevation. Uh, the pressure there is zero because it's also at atmospheric pressure, right? So these things have to sum up to the same constant everywhere along a streamline. And we can absolutely imagine a streamline that goes from point one to two to three. Right, so we can say that all three of these points, one, two, and three, are lying along the same streamline. So if at point one, the kinetic potential and pressure energy terms sum up to some constant, we'll say sum equals constant C1, then at point two, it must be the same constant, and at point three, it must be the same constant, right? So we can see how when the fluid particle goes from point one, let's say to point three, there's an exchange because those three terms, the kinetic potential and pressure terms have to sum up to the same constant. If it loses kinetic energy as it goes from one to three, it's got to gain um, potential energy, right? The energy is just transferred between terms. There's no energy added or taken away. So you can see how kinetic and potential energy are related to the Bernoulli equation. This nice example. All right, moving on if you guys don't have any questions. Uh, I wanna talk about the concept of static stagnation, dynamic and total pressure. And these are just the terms of the Bernoulli equation. Now we're not dividing by anything. We're not dividing by rho or gamma like we just did, just the plain old vanilla Bernoulli equation, each of those terms is called something. Let's write down what they are. So writing down the plain Bernoulli equation, P plus one half rho V squared plus gamma Z is equal to a constant along a streamline. All right, so this first term is the thermodynamic or static pressure. And that's what we think of when we think of a fluid pressure. If you measure pressure in the fluid, in a moving fluid, you're measuring the static pressure. Um, and before we get into the other terms, let's just look over at this baseball for a minute here. And I drew this baseball um, to point out these streamlines that are passing around it from left to right. In the middle, we've got this symmetry streamline and it ends in a stagnation point where the velocity actually comes to zero at the surface of the baseball. The streamline above it goes over the baseball, the one below it goes below, and they go around and they get accelerated, but this symmetry streamline ends in a stagnation point where the fluid velocity comes to zero. Okay, 
this is a really important concept for talking about the different types of pressure in the Bernoulli equation. So now let's look at this um, schematic on the bottom where we've got flow flowing through, let's say a pipe. It comes in with a uniform velocity V. There are no viscous effects, so that velocity is constant along the height of this channel or pipe, right? It doesn't change, it's the same at the wall as it is in the middle. Uh, and we've got a number of points marked out, right? So we can imagine drawing a streamline that goes between points one and two, absolutely, right? No problem with a fluid particle traveling along that path. Well, we can measure the static pressure at point one in this moving fluid with a manometer, like we see at the top here. And we know from hydrostatics um, what that pressure is. You see that P1 is equal to the gamma of this fluid, whatever it is, times H, right? H is the vertical elevation difference between this point one and the free surface of the fluid in the manometer. All right, great. So that's the static or thermodynamic pressure. Um, let's move on to the second term. This is this kinetic energy term. It's called the dynamic pressure. And that's easy to remember because dynamic moving velocity, it makes sense. Um, but understanding what this term is physically is not as straightforward. So let's just name it and move on to the third term for now. Third term is the hydrostatic pressure, which you won't be surprised to learn. Um, So the hydrostatic pressure um, is related to the change in pressure possible from changes in elevation, right? So it's this potential energy term. But let's talk now about the stagnation pressure. So let's go back to our um, red streamline here in this channel where we have this uniform flow with a uniform velocity V and we've got two manometers. I want you to notice a difference between the two manometers. The first one here marked with points three and four is just your regular old manometer, right? It's just connected to the side of a tank and you tell the pressure by seeing the height of the fluid in that column. But if we look at this other manometer marked with a capital H for the height, there's something strange about it. It's got a little elbow. And you should interpret that physically as an elbow. And what that means is, as that streamline meets this point two, it's going to come to a stop. This is a stagnation point because it's hitting a wall, right? Just like we have at the baseball up here, when the fluid follows the streamline and comes here to this elbow, it hits a wall and it stops. So that means that the velocity goes to zero here. It's a stagnation point. Um, so now we can apply the Bernoulli equation between points one and two. I'm gonna write the Bernoulli equation abbreviated as BE. Um, so we do that, we have P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus gamma Z1 equals P2 plus one half rho V2 squared plus gamma Z2. Now we're going to make a few assumptions to simplify this. We're going to assume that heights one and two are the same, that Z1 is equal to Z2, so no change in elevation. Um, and we just talked about how point two is a stagnation point. So this term, goes to zero. So rearranging this, we get that P2 is equal to P1 plus one half rho V1 squared. Well, this is that dynamic pressure term. Okay, so P2, the stagnation pressure,
is equal to the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure. All right, and that's always true. So if we go back to our Bernoulli equation, we've got our static pressure. We've got our dynamic pressure. We've got our hydrostatic pressure. That constant on the right-hand side is the total pressure. But then if we want our stagnation pressure, it's the sum of the static and dynamic pressure. And you can think of it as there's some, when the fluid particle is flowing along with velocity V at point one, there's some kinetic energy that has yet to be exchanged into pressure, right? When the fluid comes to a stop at point two, all that kinetic energy goes into the static pressure term. And you get your maximum possible pressure, the stagnation pressure, which occurs when the fluid velocity is zero. All right, <laughs> any questions? Just interrupt me anytime if you have a question. So what can we do? Uh, well, we can use this principle of stagnation pressure to measure a flow rate, uh, to measure a velocity. In fact, one of the first devices devised to measure um, velocities was called a pitostatic tube, and this was used on a lot of early aircraft. It's actually still used in some aircraft. Um, this idea of measuring and comparing the static and stagnation pressures to get out that dynamic pressure term, which contains the velocity, and then solving for that velocity. So here on the right, you actually see an actual pitostatic tube pressure sensor that measures velocity. And so it's, can, it's got this circular shape, the cylindrical shape, and there are actually two concentric cylindrical tubes. Um, you have some fluid flowing into the end here that comes to zero, That's, and you measure your stagnation pressure here. And then you've got these taps, these ports around the side that measure the pressure in the fluid that's not coming to rest, that's flowing by with the velocity V. You compare those and you get the pressure. So let's look at the schematic over here on the left. Um, you've got some free stream velocity and pressure coming in here. Um, and then point two is our stagnation pressure, but points one and three, or one and four measure static pressure. So if we assume this, that the elevation changes are negligible, which we can do because we're dealing with air. If we think of the example of an aircraft, we're dealing with air and pressure differences due to differences in elevation are really negligible in air compared to water or another liquid. I'm not seeing my annotations show up on the screen. There they go. All right, there's just a big time lag. All right, so if we assume the elevation changes are negligible, which is a good assumption for gases, then we can write, referring to the pitostatic tube on the left, P3 is equal to P, this oncoming pressure, plus one half rho V squared. This is just that formula for stagnation pressure that we just derived on the previous slide, right? The oncoming, uh, the stagnation pressure here, three or two, whatever is in the inner cylinder is the same as the static pressure plus that dynamic pressure. Um, again, if we neglect effects of elevation. We can say that P4 is equal to P1 is equal to P, the static pressure. Uh, 
um, let's call this equation one and the static pressure equation equation two, if we combine them, we get that P3 minus P4 is equal to one half rho V squared or rearranging, we get that the velocity flowing by this pitot-static tube is equal to square root of two, P3 minus P4, or the stagnation minus static pressure, divided by rho square root. Now I'll go ahead and box that. That's a pretty important equation. It's the pitot-static tube velocity expression, equation 316. We'll say it's the velocity measured by a pitot-static tube. All right. Um, any questions for me? We're doing on time, doing well. Let's move on. Um, okay, so moving on, we can write down expressions for the velocity of a free jet. So this is a really famous old problem in fluid dynamics. You've got a big tank, a really large tank, large enough to take make what's called a large tank assumption. Uh, and that's that the velocity at the surface of the water is essentially zero compared to the velocity of the stream of water that's exiting at the bottom, the jet. So you get this big tank of water or another liquid and you release, you open a nozzle just like we've gotten this coffee urn here and you start getting this jet of water coming out. What's the velocity of that jet and what does it depend on? Well, obviously gravity is going to be what's making the, the jet happen, what's making the water come out. Um, and we can use Bernoulli's equation to write down and find this equation. So if you look at this figure, on the upper left, we've got the water shaded in pink. The top surface is open to the atmosphere, and we're assuming that it's a really large mass of water. So even though the velocity down here at the exit jet is significant, the velocity up at the top surface is negligible. Um, a couple other things we're assuming, we're making the so-called free jet assumption. If you look at the streamlines, of this jet as it exits the tank, they don't spread apart, which would imply that the velocity in the fluid is a much greater than the atmospheric pressure, and they don't converge, which would imply that atmospheric pressure is much greater than the velocity of the jet. The streamlines are just straight. So that tells us that as this jet is exiting into the atmosphere, it's at the same pressure, it's at atmospheric pressure. We call that a free jet, that's the free jet assumption. All right, so a couple other things. We've got a nozzle with diameter D here at the bottom that the jet is exiting through. And another thing to notice is the height of the water in the tank. And that's the difference between the free surface and the nozzle, and that's marked H here. So if we apply the Bernoulli equation between point one and point two, Right, easy to imagine that those lie on a streamline. We get P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus gamma Z1 is equal to P2 plus one half rho V2 squared plus gamma Z2, right? Well, we'll start striking down those terms, right? P1 is zero because it's atmospheric pressure. Um, V1 is zero by the large tank assumption. Um, 
Z1 is H, P2 is zero because we have a free jet. Uh, V2 is non-zero, it's V. And finally, Z2 is zero. We're just setting that height of the nozzle exit plane, setting it equal to zero. All right, so we go ahead and cancel all those terms out and we get gamma H is equal to one half rho V squared, which when we rearrange it, the velocity of our jet is equal to two gamma H over rho or is equal to two G H. That's equation 318 for uh, a free jet exiting a water tank of height h. So the velocity of that jet is going to be root 2gh, right? So we see that the two things that influence the velocity are gravity, which is pulling the water down in the first place, and then just the height of the tank of water, the height of the column of water in the tank. Um, if we imagine that the water continues to fall once it exits, right? So here we were, we just derived the velocity at point two. What if we were interested in the velocity at point five, right? What if we wanted to follow that jet of water as it continues to fall? Well, then we simply add on to little h, this height, big H. And then um, rewrite the equation. So here, if we apply Bernoulli equation between points one and five, we'll get the same thing that we just got, basically that V is equal to square root of two G, and now instead of just little h, we've got little h plus big H. All right, and that is the velocity of a water jet leaving a tank or leaving your, your coffee urn. Okay. Couple more things to talk about today. If you guys don't have any questions. Want to talk about how when this jet exits the tank, it's not going to have the same diameter as the exit hole of the tank usually. If the exit is shaped really nicely and curved like a nozzle, then the exit jet of water or whatever fluid will have the same diameter but that's not usually the case. If you take a tank and you just poke a hole in the side, the water is not going to be able to make a sharp 90 degree turn. So what happens is you're going to get streamlines like this, right? So instead of turning a corner, the fluid sort of smooths out that turn. And what that results in is the eventual diameter of the jet is less than the diameter of the hole. In the, um, in the tank. Um, so we can define a contraction coefficient. C sub C is equal to the area of the jet, the cross-sectional area over the area of the hole. And you've got one homework problem that deals with a contraction coefficient. It's an underwater, you've got a gate underwater with a hole in it, and you've got fluid flowing from one side of the gate to the other through the hole, and then they give you a contraction coefficient for that hole. All right, here is um, different types of exit holes that you could have and the contraction coefficients that go along with them. So you could have a knife edge exit, which is basically just, you know, you punch a hole <laughs> and the water would have to turn this really sharp corner. And for that, 
the contraction coefficient is about 0.61. So the diameter of the jet compared with the diameter of the exit hole, it's about 60% of it. Uh, you can have a nice, smooth, well-rounded exit, like I said, a nice, smooth nozzle, and then you have no losses, right? Then the diameter of the exit jet's the same as the exit of the hole. You can have a sharp edge here. You, again, you've got about 61% of the possible diameter. And then the worst one we've got over here is this re-entrant case where it really has to turn like 180 degrees around. The fluid has to turn. Uh, and in that case, the fluid jet that exits has about 50% of the diameter of the hole. All right, last concept today is the concept of using the Bernoulli equation together with the continuity equation, or the equation that tells us about the conservation of mass to deal with flows through confined systems. So in these systems, um, the fluid inside the container is not open to the atmosphere. It may be at an entrance or an exit, but in general, it's not. So if you consider a fluid moving through a fixed volume with one inlet, and one outlet, like for example, through this syringe here on the left. At the entrance at the inlet, we've got a uniform velocity V1, which is the same over the whole inlet region. Um, this is 0.1. And then at the exit, we've got a uniform velocity V2. We've got an area A2, an exit area. Over here at the inlet, we've got an entrance area A1. Um, so if we assume now that our flow is steady um, and that there are no mass, mass sources or sinks, so there's not a little, I don't know, water spigot in there that's spraying water inside the, the syringe, right? You just have fluid coming in through the inlet and exiting through the outlet. By to, to have conservation of mass, you have to have that the flow rate of fluid in is equal to the flow rate of fluid out. Right. So the mass flow rate is m dot, and by definition, it's equal to the density times something called Q. We'll talk about that in a moment. And it has units of slugs per second or kilograms per second. So it really is mass per unit time. Well, Q is the volume flow rate. And it is equal to the velocity in the entrance or exit plane times the area of the entrance or exit plane. And it now has units of volume per time. So meters cubed per second. So you can imagine a cube of fluid moving through space um, in one second, right? So you can combine these. M dot is equal to rho. VA. So for um, incompressible 1D flow, if we have no mass sources or sinks, we must have that the flow in is equal to the flow out, or M1 dot is equal to m2 dot or rho 1 a1 v1 is equal to rho 2 a2 v2 right now normally we can assume that the density is constant right you could have a really extreme situation where it's not constant where maybe you're heating the fluid across the syringe and so that's changing the density something like that but most of the time we can assume it's constant and in that case we have the a1 v1 equals q equals a2 v2 and this is equation not 319 this is the continuity equation Really, really important. You're going to be using this for the rest of the class. Uh, and it's really handy. So for example, if in our syringe example here on the left side of the page, 
we know that the exit area A2 is half the entrance area A1. Then by the continuity equation, that tells us that V2 is equal to twice V1, right? You just come here, plug in uh, one half A1 for A2, and then you get the ratio of V2 and V1, right? So it's super handy, something that we use all the time in fluid dynamics. Last slide. <laughs> One more type of flow rate measurement, the Venturi meter. So here on the left, you see different types of ideal flow meters where we neglect viscosity, compressibility effects, unsteady effects. Um, we've got a so-called orifice meter where we just have flow through a pipe or channel and then we've got um, it being compressed into it and having to pass through a slit. Um, we have a nozzle meter where we've got a smooth, sort of exit making a jet and then we've got this venturi meter which is actually a really common way of measuring a flow rate even today so if we look at our venturi meter for any of our meters and we assume that z1 is equal to z2 if we assume horizontal flow Then the Bernoulli equation simplifies to the following. P1 plus one half rho V1 squared equals P2 plus one half rho V2 squared. Let's call that equation one. And we can then write down the continuity equation. So with the Bernoulli equation in general, we've got six unknowns, right? We've got P1, P2, V1, V2, Z1, Z2. And so if you know any five of those, you can solve for your sixth unknown. Now we can add in the continuity equation and we've got one more equation, but no more unknowns. So now we just need to know four <laughs> of those items to be able to solve for one missing one. So writing down the continuity equation, this applies to all three of these meter types. Q is equal to A1, V1 is equal to A2, V2. Call that equation two. If we now combine one and two, we recover the theoretical flow rate. through any of these meters. So Q is equal to A2 square root 2 delta P or P1 minus P2 over rho square brackets 1 minus A2 over A1 squared close square brackets close square root. This is equation 320. So basically this tells us we can determine Q, the volumetric flow rate, by measuring the pressure before either the you know, slit, nozzle, or contraction. All right, and then if you look down here on the bottom right, this is the theoretical curve. Now in reality, because of viscous effects, unsteady effects, compressibility effects, the real curve looks more something like that. All right, final slide. Uh, problem solving session with Hyungan on Friday. These are the problems we'll look at. Um, just a note on homework six and quiz six. The homework is a little bit longer. In the past, I've given you maybe five questions on the homework. This one has six questions. So just make sure to look at it early and go ahead and attend one of Young Gon's um, office hours or the problem solving session uh, if you have any questions on any of the problems there. 
All right, we're at 2.15. Does anybody have any questions? No, all right, well, thank you all very much. I know if things are getting to that point in the semester, I hope you're all hanging in there. Um, you have a great weekend and I will see you on Monday.